Okay. This is your last one um, on Sartre's existentialism and human emotions. And, um, I like ending an ethics course with this book. It puts freedom front and center into the debate and the dialogue about ethics. I believe I started this class with the claim that, um, you know, it's, ethics is a pointless debate, right? Unless we start off with the assumption that we're free. Right. So, um, to a certain extent, this was present and sort of assumed in all of the ethical theory that we've, with Kant, he actually has a complicated notion of freedom as autonomy. Right. Now, Sartre, to some extent, disagrees with Kant. We're never autonomous. Reason does not provide ourselves a position, a perspective upon which we can judge all of our particular kinds of actions. And it, it basically what Sartre wants to argue is that our best reckoning is always situated within a system and within a context, right? So it's a very situated notion of freedom, right? That Sartre is talking about here, right? Now, um, the discussion topic question tries to isolate something that it's, this is the reason I bring Kant up here, um, something that should remind you of Kant in his discussion of the three emotional states um, that, that are proper and we should find ourselves in when we encounter uh, the need to actually act and judge ethically, right, is that, that in fact they are anguish, forlornness, and despair. And I've gone through those in the video. Um, you should have a fairly good, straightforward understanding of what he means by anguish, forlornness, and despair. Um, but it's in his discussion of anguish, right, which is largely the, the big one for, can or for, for Sartre, right? He tells us first what is meant by anguish. The existentialists say at once, that man is anguish. What this means is, uh, what that means is this. The man who involves himself and who realizes that he is not only the person he chooses to be, but also a lawmaker who is at the same time choosing all mankind as well as himself, cannot escape the feeling of his total and deep responsibility. Of course, there are many people who, do, who are not anxious, but we claim that they are hiding their anxiety, that they are fleeing from it, right? And there I usually, you know, sort of conjure for myself a customer service representative saying, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. It's, it's not up to me. It's store policy kind of thing, right? I, I mean, the funny thing about a policy or offloading everything to a system is that you can just blame the system. You can escape responsibility for your actions in that scenario, right? So I, there's something fundamentally inauthentic about that kind of disposition, right? And Largely what Sartre wants to argue, and over on page 20 here, for every man, everything happens as if all mankind had its eyes fixed on him and were guiding itself by what he does. And every man ought to say to himself, am I really the kind of man who has the right to act in such a way that humanity might guide itself by, by my actions? And if he does not say this to himself, he is masking his anguish. So basically what Sartre wants to argue is that really one of the main ways that we can make a moral judgment is in terms of authenticity, right? That when we act, we have to at the same time accept that we are totally and deeply responsible for that action. Now, a little bit of background with Sartre. Sartre actually was in World War II occupied France, right? Nazi occupied France. And there were lots of people who were collaborators and even the people occupying were just following orders. They were doing what is consistent with the law. They were just applying a system and thereby claiming that they are not responsible for their choices and their actions within that context. 
What SART wants to do is call bull. Bull on that. If you're just doing your job, just following policy, and just really, you cannot divorce yourself from the responsibility for your actions in those situations. Because you are free. You're not robots. Now, to some extent, what Sartre is arguing here, that the man who involves himself and realizes that he's not only the person who chooses to be, but also a lawmaker who is at the same time choosing all mankind as well as himself, right? It sounds really, really structurally similar to the first two formulations of the categorical imperative, right? Act only in such a manner that you can at the same time will the maximum of your action should be a universal law, right? So effectively, we are lawmakers who at the same time are legislating universal law. It sounds structurally similar to that, right? And this is for Kant why we were beings with dignity who are worthy of respect. That's why we get to be ends in ourselves by Kant's formulation. Sartre means something a little bit different here. When we claim that existence precedes essence, right, we're saying something very sort of unique and special. This is the existential edge of what Sartre is claiming. If existence precedes essence, we are nothing but what we choose to be, nothing but what we make ourselves through our actions. And this applies to all of us. The human species, what humanity means, is something that is being created. Humanity, humanity might mean something different if I choose to go on a murderous rampage. Humanity might mean something different if I choose to devote myself to helping others, right? But whatever humanity is going to mean is an expression of my, your, our, all of our freedom. So, the reason Kant wants to claim that uh, human beings are beings worthy of respect, that we are lawmakers who at the same time legislate universal law, for Kant, that was because of the faculty of reason dictating the rules to us, right? We are just all interpreters of a universal reason through applications of the for of formulations of the categorical imperative. These are laws that reason dictates to us and that we interpret and act upon practically. Sartre means something completely different, right? Well, Kant, when we legislate universal law, we're basically reading these universal prescriptions of reason. For Sartre, we are more fundamentally creating what mankind is, what it means as an expression of our freedom. So it's not as though reason tells us and we do. For Sartre, we choose, we create, we do. All right? So this discussion forum question asks, um, how is Sartre's argument distinct from what Kant argues with regard to the implication of, of the first formulation of the categorical imperative? So how is Sartre different from Kant? Now, a nice illustration of what Sartre is getting at um, comes uh, towards the end. It's within your readings. Um, I'm not going to look it up for you. It's within your readings. It, basically, what Sartre does is he compares ethical choice making to uh, the activities of a painter. Right? And basically, what Sartre argues is that in the moment of an ethical choice, the situation of the chooser is no different from the situation of an artist, right? Nobody would say you're just painting arbitrarily because really there is a certain consistency that appears in the work. Right? 
It's not just an arbitrary painting, right? It's the creation of something beautiful that finds that it's building a structure as it goes. This is why we can recognize really, really great art. The greater the art, the more necessary each brush stroke appears. Right? What Sartre wants to claim is that when we make an ethical choice, what we're called upon is to engage in the same sort of motion, uh, mo sort of motion, right, of creative necessity. Right? We are, in a sense, creating, but not creating arbitrarily. We can't just do whatever we want because the situation demands a certain series of brush strokes or actions. Right? But nonetheless, as we act, we are in the same creative situation. So um, it asks you to make the distinction between Kant and Sartre. Um, really what I'm interested in is um, what you think of this argument, this your last discussion forum. Um, I like Sartre because I think he, 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 he cuts through a lot of the bowl. Right? He, so um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed the class. I look forward to reading your responses. Have good days.